All right. So we are going to talk about beyond 3G wireless technologies. And um, this is um, brand new stuff in the sense that most of this stuff probably happened in the last two or three years. And in this lecture, we'll talk about generations again. We have already talked about generations before, but I have now updated figure. And then uh, we are going to talk about um, HSDPA, HSUPA, MBMS, HSPA, and we are moving on to LTE and femtocells. All right, in the next generation, the, the next lecture will be on 4G. So this is 3G plus. So this is the generation diagram which has been updated. And um, so you already know about th that 1G was simply voice network with analog voice. 2G was um, voice network with digital voice. Then 3G is voice plus data. Our 2.5G is also voice plus data. So this is on the way here. And um, the problem with this data, the 2.5G data, is that it is really data as a voice, which means that we still use circuit switching and everything else. Instead of voice, we send some bits which are data, because we have digital voice, right? In 3G, it is really, I mean, basically data as such. And then in, 3, in 4G, we wanted all IP. All IP means even the voice is IP. Right, VOIP. Right? And so it is really the data network, fully data network. That means all packets switched and all that, right? So on the way to that, we have 3.5G, and this is what we have today 3.5G, and um, so we will talk about what is in 3.5G. Now, notice that one addition here is that previously we had only two telephony groups, the North American and the Europe, 3GPP and 3GPP2. Now we have a third group, networking industry, which is that, which means Cisco, Intel, companies that were generally not counted as telephony companies, right? And they have their own data standard called BIMAX, right? We, have we heard about BIMAX? And it turns out that BIMAX has been officially recognized by ITU as a 3G technology. I'd like to have to show in this picture now BIMAX. And this is very important because in many countries they have re spectrums reserved for 3G only. Nobody else can use it. So if BIMAX is not 3G, it cannot use that spectrum. So they worked very hard to get in there, and now in 4G, obviously, WiMAX has its own entry. Right, so we'll talk about that in the next class. And while this 3G and 3.5G is going on, so these are the things, HSPA, we talked about LTE, and so on and so forth. There was something going on in North American Camp 3G PP2 called UMB for 3G or 3.5G, and that has been disbanded and they have joined LTE. So that is an example of a Verizon, for example. Anybody who had CDMA 2000, they were going to go, or at least supposed to go to three UMB, but everybody is going to LTE. Right? So, this, so far the telephony companies are concerned, their future is LTE. The data companies are pushing for Vimax. In the Vimax next generation, right? And then for 4G, the phone companies are pushing for LTE Advanced, that is competing with WiMAX 16M. That is called WiMAX 2, by the way. There are cell phones you can buy that are HSPA compliant. There are devices that you can buy that have WiMAX. Okay, so this line I have shown here, actually this line should have come from Edge. That line is misrepresented there. But what it is showing is that the GSM guys have a choice, or at least planned, to go from edge to WCDMA. However, this is a total change. Why is it a total change? Because this is TDMA and this is CDMA. Right? And, um, and so many of them, to save money, are going through another path called edge evolution. 
right? AT&T is that example. And that is why there is a debate whether edge evolution is 3G or not, because officially WCDMA and CDMA 2000 are 3Gs, so Verizon is saying that you don't have 3G. They have 3G some places, but most of the places they just have edge and the edge evolution, maybe. They just, because it is much easier to go TDMA, this is TDMA, and so it's, it's much cheaper to stay in TDMA zone and increase the speed than to you know, switch the whole thing. And the same thing is going to happen when we go from here to 3.5G because LTE is OFDMA and all of this is CDMA. So it's not going to be cheap transition. Transition will happen but it's going to take a long time and, uh, and some of these things that we're going to talk about today are not reality, these are more, many of these are promises. Okay, but, but the point is that because there is a whole technology change, whatever happened before is going to happen now that people are going to drag, you know, for as long as they can, right? It's clear that this was all analog of DMA, this was all TDMA and CDMA, and this is CDMA, not BIMAX, but everything else is CDMA, and then everybody, the whole world, including all three camps, everybody is moving to one thing which is called OFDMA plus MIMO. So that's another lesson to learn. CDMA's days are numbered. Basically, it's the past generation. The next generation is FDMA plus MIMO. So let's see more details of the technology that we talked about. And all we have in the next three slides is actually the bit rates, the phi. And um, now that I want you to remember any of this, is just to give you an idea of the ranges of the numbers we are talking about. <clears throat> so CDMA 2000, which is a 3G technology, that is 153 kilobits per second. All right, this already shows you how underestimated those numbers are. With a 153 kilobits, how many customers can you serve? Then 2000 with 1x EVDO, actually this should be called CDMA1, I'm sorry, yeah, CDMA1, because it is 1x is CDMA1. So this is 2G technology. The 2G, we had not, we didn't have really high speed data. All we had was a voice channel in which you put, you know, data something like that. So that's why it's so low, kilobits. This went to megabits, 2.4 megabits. This is the first level of um, C, uh, 3G. Went to 3.1 megabits and stayed around that range. All right, big jump is here. In 3.5G, this actually is not happening anymore, so I should press that off, PMB. In here, same thing. We are talking about 384 kilobits in 3G, going to 1.8 megabit to 7 megabits, and so on and so forth. Then going to LTE, which is 100 megabit. All right? So the LTE has some hope, basically, in the sense that for you to be able to do some reasonable amount of data transfers, because the 384 kilobits and 1.8 megabits given to 100 users, you're not going to be able to do much, right? And that's where one problem, business problem lies, is that when these guys are making so much money on this 5 kilobit data and voice channel, $60 a month, actually I'm paying $160 a month, and this how are they going to give me 100 megabit or something where they can get million times more money? It's going to be a real business challenge to be able to support data on voice networks. But soon or later it will happen. So anyway, so to get from 3G to LTE, there are many steps. HSDPA, HSUPA, HSPA plus phase 1, phase 2 and to LTE, right? So we will talk about some of those today. <coughs> Physical layer. Again, I want to just show you as to how things are moving. So this is CDMA, um, and um, it remains CDMA all the way up to once we come to OFDM. So EB, uh, basically um, OFDM is used for multicasting there in these things, but here um, OFDM starts with uh, MIMO starts here and the OFDM starts in LTE. MIMO starts even earlier even with CDMA. Now it turns out 
सी डी एम ए हैज ए प्रॉब्लम विथ माइमो सी डी एम ए कैनॉट डू एज गुड माइमो एज ओ एफ डी एम ए कैन डू सो इवन दो आई मीन सो बेसिकली दैट वॉज वन रीजन दैट्स वाई दे कुड नॉट गो हायर स्पीड सी डी एम ए हैज मेनी लिमिटेशन एक्चुअली आई माइट हैव इस लाइड लेटर ऑन स्टार्ट अबाउट सी डी एम ए वर्सेज ओ एफ डी एम ए एज टू वाई सी डी एम ए हैज बिकम दी ओल्ड टेक्नोलॉजी बट माइमो वॉज डिफिकल्ट बट एनी वे दे पुट द माइमो हियर सो विथ माइमो वी कैन इंक्रीज द स्पीड लिटिल बिट विदाउट गिविंग अप सी डी एम ए बट वी रियली गेट गुड बेनिफिट ऑफ माइमो वंस वी कम टू एफ डी एम ए एंड आई ऑल्सो यूज द वर्ड हियर एस डी एम ए विच आई विल एक्सप्लेन लेटर ऑन एंड एन ईयर एस एस डी एम ए टी डी एम सो ऑल द डेटा रेट्स आर फॉर एफ डी डी सो वन थिंग इज बिफोर यू कंपेयर दिस विथ एनीथिंग एल्स इन वाई मैक्स वेन वी टॉक अबाउट वी डोंट टॉक अबाउट एफ डी डी दैट मच नॉट राइट नाउ बट इन फ्यूचर वी विल टूडे वी टॉक अबाउट टी डी डी इन वाई मैक्स बट हियर यू टॉक एफ डी डी ऑल द सेल्युलर नेटवर्क्स आर एफ डी डी एफ डी डी मीन्स वट डज इट मीन फ्रीक्वेंसी डिविजन डिफ्लेक्सिंग सो यू गेट सम फ्रीक्वेंसी डाउन सम फ्रीक्वेंसी अप एक्जैक्टली द सेम अमाउंट सो यू गेट ट्वेंटी मेगा हर्ड्स डाउन ट्वेंटी मेगा हर्ड्स अप सो वेन वी से ट्वेंटी मेगा हर्ड इज रियली फोर्टी मेगा हर्ड्स अलग से ऐसे हंड्रेड मेगा बेट इट इज कमिंग आउट ऑफ फोर्टी मेगा हर्ड नॉट ट्वेंटी मेगा हर्ड जर ना गेटिंग फाइव बेट्स पर हर्ड जर गेटिंग टू पॉइंट फाइव बेट्स पर हर्ड नेशनल सेकेंड थिंग इज इन एल टी ई दे यूज स्पेशल फॉर्म ऑफ ओ एफ डी एम ए विच इज कॉल डी एफ टी स्पेड ओ एफ डी एम ए आर ऑल्सो नॉन ए सिंगल कैरियर एफ ओ एफ एफ डी एम एन आई विल टॉक मोर डिटेल अबाउट दैट लेटर ऑन नाउ दिस यू एम बी मे टू लाइज बट यू एम बी एक्चुअली हैज डॉन इन एक्टिव सो देर इज अ प्रॉब्लम बिकॉज ऑन दी बिकी पीडिया इट सेज दैट यू एम बी हैज बीन अबेंड एंड विच आई बिलीव बिकॉज आई हैव नॉट हर्ड एनी न्यूज अबाउट ओ एम बी फॉर द लास्ट सेवरल मंथ्स और मे बी अयर फ्यू मे वन ईयर सो आई वेंट टू दी थ्री जी पी पी टू वेबसाइट हाउ एवर देर इज नो सच थिंग देयर इन द थ्री जी पी पी टू वेबसाइट एंड दे शो मी स्पेसिफिकेशन डेट टू थाउजेंड नाइन सो आई एम नॉट श्योर मे बी देर वर्किंग एंड स्पेसिफिकेशन विच नो वी वॉन्स टू इंप्लीमेंट आई हैव नो आइडिया बट सो फार इज इंप्लीमेंटेशन इज कंसर्न आई डो नॉट हियर एनीबडी इंप्लीमेंटिंग इट सो फार सो आई एज फार एज इज डन दिस इज इन एक्टिव क्वेश्चन मार्क डेटा रेट डिपेंड अपॉन द लेवल ऑफ मोबिलिटी नाउ अगर अदर थिंग इज दैन वेन वी टॉक अबाउट दीज डेटा रेट्स दीज डेटा रेट्स एश्यूम स्टेशनरी ऑब्जेक्ट्स दीज आर द बेस्ट कंडीशंस दीज आर द सेलिंग नंबर्स ओके सो इट्स लाइक वेन वी टेल यू वाई फाई इज फिफ्टी फाइव मेगा बिट इफ यू एवर गेट मोर देन ट्वेंटी मेगा बिट्स एन मी लेटर यू नो आई मीन बिकॉज आउट ऑफ फिफ्टी फाइव मेगा बिट्स वी राइट अवे डिडक्ट यू नो सो मच इन द कलीजन एंड सो सो फोर्थ that if you get 20 megabit you are getting the best performance on wifi and and i mean ag not an n n can probably do better so similarly these are the you know nominal numbers all right so evolution of umts what is umts umts is the mobile telephone system all right mobile telephone system means cellular system right universal mobile telephone system This is the official name for 3GPP standard for WCDMA. We call it WCDMA, but they call it EMTS because WCDMA is more like a technology rather than the name for the thing. Right? It's like if we call BIMAX and OFDMA, that would be kind of confusing. Right? So it has two parts. It has two parts. First part is from the cell phone to the tower, and that is called. UMTS access network UMTS access network and that is called UTRAN actually I should have switched that one if you want to call that as first part maybe first part we should call this one first part is the back end and that is the UMTS access network the second part is the UMTS terrestrial radio access network UTRAN which is this part the radio part So the R is uh, UTRAN, but anyway, there is two parts. There is the radio part and there is the terrestrial part. That's why I'm confused because there is a terrestrial radio here. So this radio part is is the one part which is where use WCDMA, and then there is a terrestrial part which is on the ground, right? Terrestrial means on the ground, which is actually kind of common among many of these. So the standards that they develop, they are called releases. and they release almost every year a new release 
or maybe every alternate year or something like that sometimes. These releases first were numbered by the year, so there was a release 99 which came out in 2000, but then after that they said no, no, that's not good, so let's just number them sequentially. So we have release 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8 which came out on different dates, dates like you know 2001, 2002, 5, 7 and 8 and each release brings us something new. So the key thing which is new in release 4 is TD SCDMA. So this one they've got 3G feature which was WCDMA. This one added a time du duplex synchronized CDMA. This is for China. Right? Then release 5 added HSDPA. Release 6 added HSUPA. Release 7 added HSPA. Release 8 added LTE and SAE. Okay? So we'll talk about that. All of these, most of these except this TD SCDMA. Now, I just want to introduce two more terms here. UE is user equipment, which is your cell phone. E and B is the node B. Now, in Bimax we called it base station, BS. In 3G, they call it node B. In 2G, they called it um, BTS. BTS was, I forget, BTS, right? So, tower was BTS. Now, this is this tower is called node B in 3G and E and B in LTE. And here, they have R and C, which is the, the uh, radio network or something conne connection, controller, radio network controller, and so that is where the control, most of the control is to go to, um, to control the equipment on the tower, right? All right. So these are the three terms, and, and this is called, by the way, also called core network, the one that was terrestrial network. So HSDPA is the first thing that came out in 3.5G. HSDPA, we already talked about it in one of these lectures, but I updated this slide and put it here again. And uh, because this is in the right uh, place, now that we are talking about 3.5G. And HSDPA stands for High Speed Downlink Packet Access. So before HSDPA, the data rate were very poor in 3G. So they said, well, what can we do? They said, first thing we can do is fix the downlink. What is the downlink? It goes from where to where? Yeah. The, the downlink goes from base station to the user, right? Base station is on the mountain, so you can think about it. Just imagine. Downlink. And uh, so that is easy to fix. Why is it easy to fix? Because there is only one transmitter, so there is not complexity. Even there are and com transmitters, there are two difficulties. First, there are N transmitters, so there is collision and this thing like that and gap. Second thing is, they don't have any power, these little transmitters in the hands of the people, as opposed to base station where you can put a power station next to it. Right? So, so it's very easy. So that is the first thing to fix. HSDPA. Downlinks. How do you fix it? First of all, we change the spectral efficiency for the downlink. So instead of using whatever code we were using before, we use better codes. If we are using 16 QAM, we can use 64 QAM. If we are using QPSK, we can use 16 QAM. So we get more bits per hertz just that by that method, right? Provided the channel can take it. And so with that, we can get up to 10 megabits in theory, 2 megabits in practice. and. Um, and we do adaptive modulation and coding. What that means is channel dependent coding. Basically, um, if the channel is good, we use 64 QAM. If the channel is not good, we use QPSK. Right? So, so that, by the way, that was not the case before that, the HSDPA. So if you go to 3G or if you go to 2G, the coding is fixed. And if you remember, what is the coding they use? In edge, you have to write a homework. Remember, in a homework, you have to write a coding for something, a diagram. Those of you who did that homework would remember for the edge, we had a coding called edge. We had to 
you go and find out the constellation diagram. Nobody did the homework, maybe? 8 PSK. Anyway, I mean, just that's just, just an example. I was just thinking maybe you will remember that one. But um, so all these numbers, coding were fixed. So whether you are here or there or over there, everybody had the same coding. All right. With HSDPA, they realized that obviously that is not the smartest thing to do. So they uh, have now what we call adaptive modulation coding. And they have higher order modulations. So they have up to 64, 16 quam, and then as it went on, up, up now up to 64 quam. Multi-mode. Now this is the thing which needs to be explained. Multi-mode, multiple CDMA channel transmission. So what is a CDMA channel? The way that we do CDMA is that we, we develop a code, and you get a code, you get a code, you get a code, maybe 16 bit code, that is called 16 chips per bit, right? So we, so uh, if we get a 4 bit code, we get 16 codes, right? So anyway, we get those codes, and then we give one code per user, so then one user can use only one code, only get one channel worth of bandwidth, and only one channel worth of data, and that may not be good. So for data, it is better that we put some number of channels, in this case 15 channels, they combine into one, and now it is shared between the users. So if you need right now, you can use all 15. Later on, you can use all 15. You can use 13 of those, you can use two of those. So now we have shared coding, new thing, right? And so that is how they do. So now this looks very similar to the OFDMA. On the x-axis, you have time. On the y-axis, in OFDMA, we used to have what? In OFDMA, we used to have two dimensional diagram. What was in the y-axis? How do we show in y max when we show two dimensional diagrams, what is in the y axis? Carriers, frequency. Here it is each of the code. So these are the codes, the time, and we can give any combination of code and time to any user. Right? Very similar to FDMA, but it is not orthogonal frequency, it is orthogonal code division multiplex axis. They don't call it OCDMA, by the way, but that's what it is. Right? We have orthogonal codes, but user gets more than one code and more than one slot. This is called TTI. TTI is the transmission time interval, which is 2 milliseconds. And there are six, 15 channels here. There are actually 16 channels. One of them is used for control or something. So 15 are used for data. So 15 are assi assigned for HSDPA. And they are shared among many users. And, um, and then extension to WCDMA, which uses dedicated user channels. The rest of WCDMA uses dedicated channel. You get one code and you use it. Whether you use it or not, it's yours. That is dedicated, right? With this one, it is shared. If you don't use it, somebody else will get it. Right? So this is, um, so previously, as you can see, WCDMA was designed more for voice. Whether you, know, you speak or not, you need the channel because you're really listening when you're not speaking. So basically, this is by the question grant. This is very similar to WiMAX, where the subscriber says that I need to send 300 bytes. And then the station says that this is your slot. You per frame. Per per frame. You That's why that last channel is there. So there's one channel which is basically used for a location map. How we know where to use it? Basically, first you tell the base station that I need so many bytes to be sent, so it calculates how many slots you need there, and then it tells you which slot you can use. You can use channel 5, 3, and 2, time number 1, 3, and 5, whatever. Right? So so there's no collision. Yeah, yeah. what you're saying is, can we do OFDMA with CDMA? Yes. And uh, that is called multi-carrier CDMA, where each, um, each sub-carrier has CDMA on the top of it. Yeah, that is done. Actually, in that case, generally, I mean, because this, each carrier is so little, 10 kilohertz, that uh, you don't really, you might have, you know, bigger ca carriers, then you won't use little carriers, I mean, you probably have something like that. But all combinations are possible, yes. ARQ is automatic retransmission. Basically, is that if the packet is not acknowledged, then you retransmit it. That is ARQ. 
and generally the body RQ is used at the data link layer and not at the TCP layer. So in the TCP layer we call it retransmission, right? So at the data link layer we call it ARQ. However, when we do it at the physical layer, we call it HARQ. So how do we do at the physical layer? Well, the acknowledgement comes back at the ACK layer and at the MAC layer, and the layer says, well, it is bad, then instead of sending the same packet again, we send another coding. With another coding, we send it. Maybe the coding would be incremental, could be a repeat, it could be a different number of FCC or something like that. So with a different coding, we send it so that the previous one plus this one is combined by the physical layer and then decoded. So that's why it is hybrid. Hybrid means it is two layers, physical and the MAC combined. Generally, the ARQ is just MAC layer. HARQ is combined, hybrid. All right. Third thing they did was, a final thing, I don't know how many things that we have talked about so far, is that they moved the scheduling to node B. Why? Because previously node B was dumb and if you have to decide when to transmit, what to transmit, you have to go to RNC which was somewhere, you know, miles away. And if you want to do HARQ and you want to do this dynamic scheduling like this, right, you need to be near the action, right? So that means that we don't have to go to RNC for all of this. This all this is, such decisions are made right at the node B. What is node B? Base station. All right. So the radio network controller is be far away and we don't go there, okay? So this is HSDPA. So then we can do something similar with HSUPA. UPA is uplink. High speed uplink packet access. However, it is difficult. Why it is difficult? Because there are multiple transmitters and if we let multiple transmitter transmit and let's say C is speaking and C is speaking very softly, and you are speaking, are speaking very loudly, when you speak, my ears get tuned to your level, when she speaks, I can't hear it. That same thing happens to antenna. You know, if, you, if they receive some high level signal, and then they receive some low level signal, they can't hear it. Right? And in fact, if they speak at the same time, and one is speaking on frequency 1 or code 1, and another is speaking on code 2, you can just imagine what will happen. You know, one is speaking code 1. Code is like languages, right? So one is speaking in Chinese, one is speaking in English, and in Chinese is very, you know, loud, or English is very low, or something, you know, combination you can think about. Very difficult to do that. So what is required is power control. Power control means everybody's level has to be set so that all is speaking at the same level. Right? So what they have to do is they have to ask, they have to listen to the user's level and say, look, 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 you have to increase your level by a factor of four. You have to reduce your factor by a factor of two. So there is a feedback. Right? The transmitter has to tell the receiver, actually, the receiver has to tell the transmitter that please reduce your power. That means the base station has to tell this mobile, please, you are very close to me. My ears are you know, getting turned apart. So that is required. A scheduler in node B, but data in UE. Now there's another problem. That now the scheduler is not where the data is. Now we, we moved the downlink scheduler from RNC to E and B, but uplink, the scheduler is still in the base station, but the data is in the mic mobile, so there's one feedback loop there too. The mobile has to tell the base station that I have so much data then the base station schedules it and then you send it. Third thing is a single user cannot utilize all codes to so parallel transmission in each TTI. So basically previously there was only one transmitter, 15 codes and all 15 were used by the base station. Right? Here now we have to you know, distribute it. And then HARQ has to be again same thing, you know, we have to implement HARQ if we want to implement. It's called, by the way, it's just called fast HARQ, but basically it's the same thing. Now we have to make it more smart. This was not there before. So it's just UPA was done in some release as we saw. 
that was released six in 2005, right? And then they were combined together to form HSPA. But before I go to HSPA, I must want to talk about MBMS. So <coughs> after HSUPA, they also also had a new feature called MBMS. MBMS is Multimedia Broadcast Multicast Services. So a good example is mobile TV. So it's not worth sending a mobile TV to five users if five people are watching the same TV. Right? So they said, well, why don't we just introduce this concept of multicast and broadcast first time? Right? Now, if you do multicast broadcast, then the question is, shouldn't we synchronize all of the towers as well? So basically, that is what is done, is that if you do broadcast, all the towers will be sending, they will reserve a particular time, they will synchronize, and they say, okay, at one minute after, you know, or one millisecond after, you know, this time, you know, I will start my multicast, you will start multicast, same program, same time. All right, so the program goes to all the towers, is broadcasted, and everybody receives it. That is broadcast. But if you want to do multicast, then you have to be a little bit more complicated, in which case you have to find out if you have a user in your range where the user is and uh, whether you can just broadcast to that user. In some cases, it might be just good enough to just do unicast rather than multicast. You know, or do, you know, if there were two users are here, both of them are here, then you just direct to that side rather than do everywhere. So all that comes in with the multicast. So node B tracks the users and directs the signals accordingly and could even be unicast if there is only one user. This is a new mode before actually everything was unicast, right? Everybody has a channel and dedicated channel and so on. So, so all of this is combined, is called HSPA. And um, with HSPA, you can get up to up to 64 QAM in the downlink. 16 QAM in the uplink in release 7 and release 8, which is the latest release. Actually, I think release 9 is probably out now. Um, but um, release 8 allows 64 QAM and MIMO in the downlink. So now MIMO has been added here in release 8. All right. So, so much about um, HS business, right? High speed. 